Okay, I've just pressed record. So there you go. This is a bit of an experiment. Ben, what are we doing? What are we doing, Ben? Yeah, we're answering questions, having discussion, um, hopefully engaging with the community. It's not just the three of us. <laughs> uh, we've already got two people. Um, so that's a start. So be good. So you, you, you sent a you sent a request out on Twitter, and I think it was um, I think it was sufficiently vague that really anything goes. It's not necessarily just oh, yeah. AWS, but any anything. Mike and I can answer questions about uh, T preferences. Absolutely. So <laughs> wait, wait, wait. Sorry, Jared, you can't you can't answer questions about T preferences. Uh, not really, to be perfectly honest. Coffee I'm just looking for the talk about. yeah, just, just well, looking for the kick from room button. The kick from room button's got to be here somewhere. <laughs> well, that's the thing. We need we need the coffee coverage. Yeah. All right. All right. All right. I can't give it. <laughs> Nor me. We have to be cross-platform in this regard. <laughs> Multi. So I, 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 I'll, I'll question. Yes, for, please. For, Ben or whoever, but I think I saw you talking about this and it's favorited my Twitter list and haven't made a chance back to it, but with the kind of with the introduction of containers for Lambda, um, I forget it was you and somebody else who were, who were discussing this um, and you, I guess, can you maybe just give some of your thoughts on that? I know like it looked like it was going to be a little bit more along the lines or what I was expecting was kind of like what Cloud Run offers, um, but it still looks like you're kind of constrained by it still has to know it's Lambda and kind of handle all the eventing and more of the runtime itself. Yeah, and I think, so I think the, the term container is overloaded. It sure. means a bunch of different things. So it is a packaging format. So it's a way of packaging up a image, right? right? And it is also um, associated with an execution model, which is on Linux, you can, and now Mac and Windows, you can uh, take a container image and run it in an isolated way that reuses your kernel. Um, it is also associated with a cloud application model that uses container images run on VMs or some other kind of execution engine like Fargate and orchestrated as a complex application altogether. And so when we say like, oh, containers, that means you know, many different things to many different people. Sure. And uh, so I think um, with Lambda and containers, Lambda is very narrowly scoped to just the packaging format part. So it has its own execution model, which again is, it's gonna run, it's gonna take one request at a time um, and doesn't involve any of these sort of orchestration stuff. All of that is outside of it. But what it is saying is that instead of bringing your code in a zip file, right, right, right. Um, or you know a tar file, right, would be another packaging format, um, or an AMI, right, is another right. way of packaging up an image. But what they're saying is now you can bring the container image as the way of bringing your code into Lambda. Now one of the consequences of that is that the way containers are structured is that they want to be the whole image. Right. And whereas the zip file, you know, the zip file goes on top and is just sort of injected into the environment that's already there defined by Lambda. And so right. the downside of the container image is then the entirety of that is pinned in perpetuity. So when I bring a zip file and I write in Python, the right. Python runtime, the like minor versions, uh, or not the minor versions, but the patch versions of Python get updated by Lambda. The OS gets updated by Lambda. Right. And when I bring a container image, currently- You own the whole thing. I own the whole thing, even if I'm using a Lambda provided base image. Sure. Now they update that and provide those updates to me, but then I have to positively take action to rebuild the container image and hand it back to Lambda. Got it. Now, that being said, there are technologies that allow you to take a known base layer, right? Because a container image is a sequence of overlays. Yep. Yep. And you can take something on the bottom and swap it out for something else. And they, they call it rebase. Um, and so in theory, Lambda could be doing that for us. 
right? That uh, if we're using a Lambda base image, okay, uh, they could see that, that it's a Lambda base image. And if we click the box that says, please update my base images, they could do the rebuild whenever they have an update. And then it would work just like a zip file, right? In that my code that I've brought stays applied to a changing substrate. Okay. And at that point, I think containers are actually probably better for a production use case than zip files. Because I both have the ability to leave it in this opt-in update mode, but that if anything fails, I get to peel it back to a, to a particular specific image to know right. that it would just work, right? Sure. Um, and, uh, and then I also know when I'm building my production code that it's going to work because I built it as a container. I know all those things, right? Now, I right. still think, you know, when you're just, you know, building something and it's not, you know, you don't need those kind of controls because it's not that mature yet. Zip files are going to remain an easier way to go about it. Right. Okay. That makes sense. I think this has been I do think, hard. Yep. Oh, sorry. I was, I'm just a little, little interjection. I, just, I think this has been hard. Um, and I think AWS have done everything right in terms of what they've said from a technical point of view. But um, can, can, containers are not necessarily Docker, and Docker is not Kubernetes. Um, it's, right. it's, it's this technology which can be used. I've seen, I've seen people on um, other videos, like YouTube videos and stuff, who are ranting about this and saying, AWS has literally, this is what they said. They said, AWS has broken the Docker API um, uh, because, because now my um, Docker, um, my, my Docker um, containers are being uh, triggered in this completely different way that was never intended by the way that people that wrote Docker meant it to happen. And um, you know this, this Lambda thing that they're doing has broken it all which clearly isn't the case. It's really difficult yeah. messaging because everybody just assumes Docker containers are Kubernetes. Right, or you know, they assume I could just open a port number and my thing responds. Yeah. It's not even remotely close, right? right. I think yeah. <clears throat> the original misconception and the keynote could have, it, it's, it's hard, right? Like how deep do you go into a keynote and talking about something? Cause you know, you can't say, you know, it, it was much as there's containers on Lambda and it was kind of surrounded with ECS and, and Kubernetes and all of that stuff. And you just go, oh, great. It's another execution model for my legacy Rails app in a container. It's not, right? It was right. A, a packaging mechanism more we familiar with enterprise. That. Yes. But it should not be Lambda as we know it today. Right. This it's, is the other, the other angle, which is we should not try and fit all compute use cases into Lambda. The future is not that everything is a Lambda function and all compute needs are served only by Lambda functions. We need a small handful of different ones. And so this is where, you know, something like Cloud Run has a really great model for those, you yep. know, right. I have a Rails app and it's not, like it's well suited for concurrent access, right? All of those kind of things. Um, and because you're coming from that world, you have some sense of how much like how much concurrency you can have. Um, but I don't think that should be inside a Lambda function where you're just able to say concurrency is, you know, some knob that you turn. Yeah, we're not, we're not deploying exchange into Lambda quite yet. <laughs> That would be interesting to see. I'm sure someone's going to <laughs> Would it? <laughs> yes. Aaron, have you, um, have you played around with, um, are you in this space much? Are you playing around with this stuff? Um, I would love to say I have, but uh, I think it, my, my lament with this year's reInvent was I haven't even caught up with last year's reInvent. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so kind of just drowning. <laughs> Um, I, I, it is stuff I want to look into. Um, so, so for context, I'm, I'm a cloud solutions architect for Qualcomm. So I kind of help with across the business. Um, so touch on a lot of different things. Serverless is one area I've been um, trying to help facilitate more usage of. Um, and I think just uh, 
it's still hard to get people to buy on that when we're still so used to the paradigm of I have a tangible server I can do something with. What do you what do you mean there's a difference there? So why do you think people love Cloud Shell so much? They're so excited for it because they get a, a server that yeah. they can feel comfortable with. <laughs> I'm still just waiting for somebody to use S3 Fuse to mount their S3 bucket and claim infinite storage on Cloud Shell. I would, I would rather Cloud Shell have S3FS in it as the only persistent storage mechanism because then I would get insight. I would right. get visibility into all the things that people are storing and persisting that I need data governance over. Whereas today, <laughs> True. I don't have anything. Yeah, you have no idea what's in there. Until there's an That's audit, true. and then we have to find out what's in it. Right. right, right. And then you find out it's not the stuff that you want. <laughs> right. If you can even find it. I'm 100% with you on that. Um, that's, that's, that was my first thing when I was looking at this was like, you've got, you're going to have what? I think there's 150 different cloud shells you can have inside of a single account. Am I right? I may, that might even be a soft limit. So it's like potentially like 150 yes. gigabytes worth of data that you have no management over and you don't know what's there, where it is, or how, or necessarily how to, how do I do anything with it? I don't actually know, like an as administrator of an AWS environment, how can I deal with someone else's cloud shell environment? I mean, presumably there's an API that, I can call. None of that appears solved. Mm. Um, have, have you guys looked at the pricing model on cloud shell? I'm still not 100% not sure. Does it have it's a pricing free. model? It's free. It's, it's free. So, and, well, Until you what? transfer data out of the AZ that you don't know it exists in. Corey started talking about this. So why can't I like Bitcoin mine on like 10,000 cloud shells? <laughs> Do it. You can, um, you can, but I think it's a P3 micro. Yeah, so you're not yeah. going to get much Bitcoin. <laughs> <laughs> go, go for Monero. Use those CPU cycles. But I saw somewhere, it, it tells you when you log in, it tells you what plan you're on. Oh, does it? I, I barely yeah, opened it just three, which implies that there will be paid plans later. Interesting. Yeah, okay. Didn't see. Yeah, no, I opened it. And I, I, don't, I like, like it. I like it and don't see it as any kind of production system. It's to me, it seems it's part of the console and it's a way to issue. Um, uh, AWS, I uh, call AWS APIs without having just in the browser. So you don't have to uh, be running an AWS CLI from your own computer. You're just doing it in the cloud. I look at it very much like the EC2 um, console where, yeah, I can, it, it saves me a step from having to SSH into my machine. I can just open up a console and do something on an, on a uh, uh, running instance. So, I, so I, that, that's what I plan on using it for. I think my, my take on it, if I can just just quickly, um, yeah. is that it's it's awesome it's awesome for people who are brand new to AWS, and you come into this environment, you're like, what what do I do? And you're you're telling me that I should be doing various things on the command line, and I can do things on the command line, but then I have to set up my own environment, all the rest of it. And I think it, it, it sort of eases those people into that world. There is obviously session manager um, for people who want to be able to connect into boxes and actually do things on actual boxes. Um, and there are some um, awkward, but there are some uh, patterns to allow you to do that and sort of integrate that with your tooling and the such. The one place that I was never particularly uh, sure of what the best solution was in relation to that is um, doing um, is when you've got a is when you've got a cluster environment when you've got like a Kubernetes environment it's not clear to me that you could actually use session manager to connect into those instances so having a shell environment up there is not bad but right now it's public only you can't get into private private endpoints it's very it's very Gen one but absolutely I see yeah. it as a as a step a step to help new people in the environment. Because just just for all of us who have been around in AWS for a long time, um, just imagine what it would be like to arrive into AWS now and just be like, yeah. all this stuff. And then all of this stuff that you've got to set up on your own machine in order to be able to get access to stuff, it just, it just eases that process, I think. Sure. So Scott brings up a point which says it helps av avoid people who are, who are using IAM users for access. 
from creating long-lived access keys that they need to do command line things. Um, you wouldn't agree with that, Ben. <laughs> no, I would. I mean, that's, sorry, that sarc is sarcastic me. mark there. Sorry. <laughs> um, that is that is helpful. I, I would suggest that those people move to AWS SSO um, uh, rather than IAM users. Um, but that's a that's a separate question. Um, the uh, the other thing that I think what I would like is that users don't get any persistent storage, but they can uh, they get to um, they get to define a GitHub or code commit repo that will get cloned into their home directory mm -hmm. um, whenever a shell starts. It's kind of similar to the Cloud9 model to some extent, right? right. Yep. Um, so that A, you get that it's ephemeral, uh, but you know exactly what it's going to look like. And so you don't have to worry about getting it cluttered up. Um, and then the other thing is then you get visibility for each user into um, what uh, what the contents of, of, of their environment is. Oh yeah, Mike wants people to be aware that we're recording. Although hopefully you get a notification when you enter. Is that true? I don't know. I don't know. This is all new to me, but uh, yeah. No, I got I just... a notification. Cool, excellent. Yeah, I just wanted everybody to know that we are recording this and we'll be sharing it around on various social platforms, but just thought it was fair to let you know. Just drop that in chat. Sorry, didn't mean to interrupt. That's why I put it in chat. It wasn't supposed to become a thing. <laughs> so Aiden brought up a good point, and this is something we could test also. Hi, Aiden. Um, so Aiden's a coworker here um, of mine. Um, he brought up, can a user have web console access? So they would get... Uh, theoretically cloud shell access, but not have CLI access. Like what happens in that scenario? I don't actually know. I don't Looking for, you know, those orgs that have a strange uh, trust model where they trust you with the web console, but not the CLI. Um, let's not get into why they do that. <laughs> um, uh, cloud shell sh sort of throws a spanner in the works there, right? But you could just keep them out of, the, of cloud shell, right? Like we're just yeah, dropping yeah. an SCP to keep SCP cloud yeah. shell off until they've got some visibility into all those things um, that I need visibility into. Yeah. My restricted user last night didn't have access. You have to uh, actually turn it on in IAM. You've got to give the you have to give the role permissions. That makes sense. Yeah, I I'm, I'm curious if it needs like EC2 create permissions or something behind the scenes. What all you know? No, it's its own service. No, yeah. it, it has its own it's list. list. Okay. Hmm. How, you, how ask, are you finding well, the startup Aiden, times on it? it? Oh, go ahead. Sorry, I just had my question was, how are you finding the startup times on it? So for me, I've, th this is my other little gripe with it is that it is region restricted at the moment. It's like a few regions in the US and Tokyo. I should connect to Tokyo for whatever reason I didn't. I connected to um, to where everybody connects in Virginia. Um, from here, it's as slow as just all, you know, throughout the whole session. But I'm just wondering what startup times are like. Um, it's, it doesn't feel like something you can just jump on to to do something quick. Mine was like an like a 60 minute or 60 seconds or something like that. Enough that it was friction. Like, mm. like I clicked it and was like, did it break? And then it worked. I mean, in some sense. But starting a new session seems to, um, it doesn't shut down when you close it out, I don't think. It, it stays running for a little bit. And then if you reconnect, it's almost instantaneous. Interesting. Yeah. We've actually built something pretty similar. Uh, for uh, for access um, on the EC2 instances that will provision something and shut it down later in that kind of way. Um, be nice to see however Cloud Shell works, the ability to expand that to something that you get a proper session manager session into, um, but has the, the management features of that on a per user basis and all those kind of things. The other thing to note is that uh, the home directory that you get is per IAM user or per role plus 
unique session name. Uh, so in other words, if I'm role A, session name Ben, um, and then I log in as role B, session name Ben, um, I get those two are not connected, um, which I think is unfortunate. Um, I think that creates a little bit of a moral hazard that encourages people to always select the highest privilege role that they have. Um, so they always get the same home directory. Like I'm a fan of having, when I have admin access, I also have a admin read only um, so that I can go in and know I'm not gonna break anything. Um, and if my cloud shell is not uh, going to be the same between those two, I'm probably gonna use the read only one less for that reason. I suppose you could install scripts on there that are going that, that allow, you know, do, do the, the role switching within the uh, console that maybe. defeats the point, right? And it's not possible for AWS SSO roles, no, sure, right? The, sure. the assume role policy is just for the AWS SSO SAML. Sure. Fair, fair. And it's also um, it's also region specific as well. I'm sorry, I don't know if you mentioned that, but I know that's not the point. Oh, you're sure. making, but, but that's uh, I mean that's by that's. I would sense. always assume that. That's an yeah. implicit assumption. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Jeff asks, uh, what do I think would be a better experience for multiple roles? So I think uh, for AWS SSO in particular, where there is a persistent user identity that is available um, beyond the roles that get created, it should be unique to that. Um, for I am roles that are say federated into uh, some SAML provider, that gets a little more fuzzy. Um, the role session name is set by like the username coming in from the SAML. And so you could trust that, uh, but it gets a little hazier because the role session name is not, uh, like you can reassume that role sometimes if it's got the right trust policy and then set your own session name and then spoof yourself with something else. So um, I think it gets, a little trickier, but for SSO roles in particular, it makes a lot of sense for it to be per user because then you could also even connect that across account. If you had some sort of opt-in cross account permission um, that you could mount your storage from the other thing um, into your, into your shell in one account. Um, and it would allow you to do that only if you're the same user kind of thing. I mean, right right now, it's um, if you look at the product page, it's got a bunch of things which it's saying are coming in the future. So clearly, it's got more development coming. Clearly, it's a, a, a minimum viable product at this point. And I, I don't suppose that many of us are going to be using it, frankly. And it's probably not, not we're talking gonna, about us. We're going to jump at it. Um, and uh, yeah. Uh, honestly, um, Maybe my use case is a bit different. I'm going to be using it a lot because when I need to upload, um, not as relevant nowadays, now that I'm not doing so much Docker images, but if I need to push from the Australian East Coast to US East one, mm. that can be really slow. Uh, so I'd rather build my images remotely, uh, you know, upload a Docker file, build it in a remote environment near AWS and push it from there. Uh, of course, this particular example uh, doesn't work because Docker doesn't work in Cloud Shell. Doesn't work. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> for people for people with uh, third world internet like Australia, or <laughs> actually a lot of third world countries have better internet than Australia, um, I think that's actually going to be quite useful when you're in low bandwidth scenarios. Is is it different than like Cloud Nine in that care, in, in that scenario? In that scenario, Cloud Nine is probably something I should check out. I've never clicked on that button in the console. You should. Is it good? I'm going to be using it very much like Cloud9. It's uh, Cloud9 brings too much to the table for me. I don't use the IDE. Um, this is just a simpler Cloud9 for me and more performant. I think I would get more use out of something that was just a JavaScript translation of the, the calls, right? So separate from the... Uh, separate from the, the persistence and all of those kind of things, just the notion of give me a place where I can type AWS S3 LS um, and have that 
go fetch those things. It wouldn't actually need to be some you know proper environment or anything. Um, I think hmm. that would be the benefit that I that I would get out of Cloud Shell that I don't actually need all the rest of the the bits. It's just whether it's quick enough for those. I just need to do something quickly thing. Like you may as well right. just just go back to your small EC2 instance somewhere that you can spin up or the command line of your own machine, people. <laughs> well, now now that I wrote that AWS SSO util configure populate that will just put all of your access into your .AWS config file. Nice. Now my need to use the management console to go do something for a particular thing that I, for particular access that I don't use much has reduced a lot, I think. Sure. I, or I for dev, I'm going to be, I mean, just, have, just having a, a CLI that I can just hit things with for development environments, I think it's just, this just, it keeps me from having to spin up a small EC2 box, which I do all the time. Now I won't be doing that. I'll just jump into Cloud Shell. Sure. That's a win. Yep. So who's, so, so, I mean, I don't know, by show of hands in the chat or something, who's using SSO? There's a, there's a reactions button. Uh, Is that, there you go. Maybe. You're not turning on video. A little reaction video, yeah. There you go. What about oh. a hat hand for want to, but we've run into obstacles getting there. Sure. <laughs> what are your what are your obstacles? Uh, so so that was actually part of my part of my question is so um, so we have a large enterprise environment and so like AWS SSO obviously has a lot of benefits for mm -hmm. ecosystem, um, but we currently have uh, through our current IDP set up a means of allowing users to basically self service define their own roles and permissions in an account for their own development and operations teams. Yep. Um, what I can't find through AWS SO is basically a way to do that because I'd essentially need to kind of remove the concept of a permission set because I'm not gonna give a user access into the organization directly. Um, I need to be able to basically just take a role and map it to a group with a set of permissions. And I, I've talked with the AWS SSO team about this, but more so on like the partner integration side and less on the actual SSO team side. Um, and it, it seems from everything I can see that there's something missing there. Like I think Okta so, has a solution. Yeah, go ahead. So you want to allow people to request permissions. It, effectively or define their own roles. So I, if like, if I have a uh, hundred accounts, like, you know, accounts one through 10 may just have like standard roles. And so I'm fine with that in permission sets, but there's probably a good 20% of the accounts that we use where, um, so like a very common use case, like a, a bunch of engineering teams doing some work and uh, they wanna generate and look at some reports in QuickSight. So I need to be able to basically just build a role for them that says, all you can do is read QuickSight and, and data out of the Spice engine, essentially. So what's the problem uh, with demand. creating a permission set for that? So I could, but then without writing my own abstraction layer to basically allow someone to go to like a UI and say like, I want to create my own permission set because mm -hmm. I don't want to give Joe user access into the organization to create a permission set themselves. Yep. So does it need to be a, uh, does it need to be like a web UI? Because um, the alternative, to. right, is um, if you de define these in cloud formation, Okay. Right, so you have a repo that people can open pull requests on, and so they they create a uh, a template um, with the uh, the permission set that they need and the assignments that they want. Right, what accounts do they want that to go into? And then you've got CI/CD on that repo that just deploys right. all the templates inside it. Um, and you've got sort of two options for how you might do that because I would not attempt to do that in vanilla cloud formation. In particular, um, in a large enterprise environment, you probably have a lot of accounts. Yes. And when someone's requesting something for uh, 30 people and two different permission sets and 10 accounts, um, you end up with a lot of assignments. Yes. Uh, and so um, uh, uh, Olaf, from Steady, um, wrote a resource provider that um, allows you to define for a single principle 
a set like multiple permission sets and multiple accounts and you get the combinations of those. Okay. Um, so you would install that resource provider in your organization management account and then use that inside those templates. I will link it right now. So for those of you on the call that don't know, Olaf is also a coworker of mine and Aiden's. Yes. Um, he built something called org formation, which is a super set of cloud formation to manage all of your AWS stuff. As part of that, we wrote, uh, he wrote a community resource provider to fix SSO in terms of how it works with cloud formation. Um, so I will link that right now. And uh, so I went a different route to fix this problem because I didn't want, so this single resource provider is responsible for a number of, uh, um, a number of different uh, assignments. And it's unclear to me what happens if one of those fails. Um, and especially if it's failing during rollback, um, so what I wanted was I want CloudFormation to manage um, all of this directly. Um, and uh, so what I did was I wrote a macro. So you install the macro in your account and you use that in the transform section of your template. And it does two things. One, um, the assignment group that I wrote allows multiple principles. So you can define the entire combinations, which is a little different from uh, the one that's written there. I don't think it's a huge difference as the number of principles is generally relatively low. If you get to a certain number, you're going to create a group in your IDP for it. Um, the, uh, um, the other piece uh, is that it fixes some of the problems with the permission set resource. Um, so for one thing, uh, you don't need to put instance ARN on there. It will look that up for you. Um, you can have the, you can tell the macro that you want a default session duration across, um, all the things. Um, and you can write your inline policies in YAML rather than a string containing JSON, which is terrible. Yeah. Um, and uh, so it does, it does those things. And what it does with the assignment group is transform that group. It goes and looks up, it just generates all the assignment resources. And if there are more than would be able to be contained on a single stack, it goes and puts them in child stacks. But you end up with something where CloudFormation is individually managing every assignment, um, okay. which for me is cleaner, but uh, there's, you know, uh, kind of six of one, half dozen of the other between these two approaches. Um, I'll put a link to that part um, in, uh, in the chat as well. I'm pretty close to declaring that sort of out of beta. Um, uh, it seems like some of the, some problems that I was seeing with the assignment resource early on don't seem to be happening anymore. Um, so and I, I think it's got a pretty stable, stable API for that. Probably goes without saying, but any of these links that we're talking about, I'll make sure that when we distribute this video around to many and varied places that they follow with it. So do look for that. All right. Other questions people have? What are people interested in thinking about from reInvent, wondering about their architecture? I've got one, and Ben and I have talked about it a little bit on Twitter. And that is a, a constant thorn in my side uh, that I still haven't found any reasonable solution for. And that is if, if my system needs to stream data into it, but I need to be the client. So I'm hitting, say, a third-party website uh, with a web socket that needs to stay open and the data will be, will stream. Uh, how are you handling a situation like that? There's plenty of solutions for me to call into AWS from an outside uh, to get to my to stream data into my system. But if my system is pulling the data from an open stream, I, I've got to have either a container or an EC2 box 
uh, how is a serverless model uh, handling something like that? Come on, Ben. Certainly serverless needs today. to do everything, Ben. Come on, go. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it does. I, you know, certainly have questions about whether a managed service would be able to accomplish that. You can imagine that a WebSocket gateway could open that connection and when WebSocket messages came through, you know, transfer them out to some event sync, whether that's SNS, SQS, Lambda, um, Kinesis, whatever. Um, but I think, you know, there's so many questions about auth in there. Um, how do you know that you need to establish a connection? How do you authenticate it? What would you want that to look like? As far as I can see, I would, I would, for instance, call a Lambda function to establish a connection. And then once the connection was established, go away. If the connection is, if there's no messages come inbound, I could shut down. And then when I get a packet on that connection from a third party, refire up my Lambda and handle that packet. If I get a connection, if the connection drops or a heartbeat is missed, for instance, uh, fire up and fix the problem. Uh, but the connection handling is a mostly idle situation. So I shouldn't have to continue to run, but, the, but once I shut down the Lambda, that connection's gone. So the, the, I, there's no way to handle any inbound messages to that IP address. So I can imagine, for instance, attaching an elastic IP to Lambda, and then Lambda goes away, but whenever an incoming message comes in on the IP, Lambda fires back up and handles the message. And so so I have one question, and then Tim Bray has uh, um, raised his hand, which um, very much inclines me to listen to what he has to say. Uh, the question I have for you is, do you want this? So with WebSockets, I could imagine it happening at the message level. Do you want something that operates at like the packet level, like that low level in the network? Not really. I mean, if that was the only way to do it, I would do it that way, but I would actually prefer a higher level service. Okay. All right. So I, I noticed that um, they just announced an integration of Lambda to uh, MQ, which yeah. is, um, uh, uh, what's it called? Uh, Amazon MQ, I uh, know it, it's uh, Apache MQ uh, under the covers. And um, it wants to talk on a nailed up TCP IP connection, which is oh, different from a WebSocket, but not that different. And it strikes me that the problem they would have had to solve is, is nearly identical, right? They would have had to watch mm. that connection for messages to come in and then turn around and hand them to the Lambda. So what you got to do is next time you talk to somebody from the Lambda team, beat them up and get them to open source the uh, polar they had to build to uh, to get stuff from MQ, because I think that would be more or less exactly what you need. Interesting. So like an event source mapping could be could be reading from a WebSocket connection. Yeah, and then you just take it, have the Lambda just drop it into an SQS or an S3 bucket or you know whatever it is meets mm -hmm. your needs. That would be superb. The only reason I run a ACS now is to keep an open WebSocket connection, and every message I get on it, I invoke a Lambda with that payload. If I could That's outsource how they that, it. yeah. If I could outsource that to a uh, event source mapping, I'd be very happy. How do you? How would you want to handle authentication in that case? It's too hard. Involves too much thinking. In my case, the web sockets I'm interested in don't have authentication. That's a tricky one, I guess. Because I, I think about this case for when you have OAuth, right? And say one of these WebSocket connections need to, needs to get open for every one of your customers because each one needs to be authenticated with an OAuth token that they've given, right? That you have on behalf of the customer. And so this event source mapping, sure, if it's pulling from one source, right? But if I have to open millions of them and each one has its own authentication, um, it's, I mean, separate from all the hard technical problems of accomplishing that um, in, a, in an economical and, and, and feasible manner, 
is uh, just how do I provide the, uh, the auth into it in a way uh, that would work for all those different connections. You guys notice this uh, uh, co connection between, between self-managed Kafka and Lambdas, not Amazon. So you have a yeah. TCP IP connection to, to a self-managed uh, Kafka. So it means that Does you it... can, there is a way to, uh, now you just point to some, to, to some point, uh, to some IP address and that's it. So there is and... probably an option to get some kind of a polar yeah, do you know if that requires any changes on the Kafka side? It's your Kafka. It's no, I know, but do you have to do you have to make any changes to your existing Kafka deployment to make it work with? No, I just think that you you, you just point it to an IP address and connect it. But what, what, wow. I didn't check the authorization there, so yeah. how it works. <laughs> so that's the first service, which is like a self-managed Lambda. Yeah, that's it's interesting. Cool. That opens some ideas for for this one. To listen to a kind of a web socket or whatever, I don't know, and push that into directly into into queue for lambdas. Yeah, lambda execution queue. So we can put anything into that queue. That would be great. But then who's going to authorize that? How's that going to work? <laughs> they seem to leave that as an exercise to the user. I think they're yeah. imagining that you would just process that Kafka message and authorize yourself in the Lambda function that Kafka would invoke, which is helpful, but also not. <laughs> yeah, you, you can put anything. Yeah. That's true. Welcome, Ant. And really everyone who's joined since we last welcome people. Great to have you all. Absolutely. Maybe I should mention my brief. We are recording this, by the way, and it will be put up onto social media at some point, <clears throat> excuse me, in the future. So say something you're proud enjoying... of. Oh, yeah. How are people enjoying Ream then? Great. Apart from the session catalog, I, I like it. Okay. Is it still going? <laughs> <laughs> Will it ever stop? <laughs> yeah, I saw someone today say, oh, yeah, I'm excited. You know, it's, it's uh, we're almost to the end of it. It's like, no, no, no. there's another mm. week in January. Uh, they just yeah. announced a, a location service. So it's going to be more. Yeah, that was pretty cool. That was. Does anyone no have? One use cases that, that they're, they're excited to, to try out the location. Right, now I've, I've missed, I've missed this. Can someone explain what it is? It's Google Maps. Google Maps but from yeah. the US. <laughs> That's it. <Yeah>. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hopefully with a better free tier. Yeah. yeah. They didn't announce the pricing so far. So. The um, first three months will be free when you test it out. So you can, oh, uh -huh. at, so no free until to some point, um, like get a feel for the pricing. Like the announcement said, the first three months are free with like up until a point in there, like it's like with a generous quota. So yeah. uh, I assume there will be like a limit that you will hit if you like do a gigantic amount yeah, of Google data for that. But over to it. Yeah. <laughs> What's everyone's uh, like favorite little feature that got announced? I think my personal favorite is the the ability to pass state between lambda functions. Uh, they, cool. They're called the analytics thing, but to chain persistent yeah. state across a window, um, like instantly solved a couple very real needs for us that we were like trying to figure out how to do. Do you know so how big that can be? Could you use it for caching? It's one megabyte. So it's, it's not big enough for caching. You get you get up to a five megabyte payload, and then one megabyte of um, like memory across those. Yeah. Um, and also, I don't think it would really work. Uh, like, what would you use it in terms of caching for? Because it's only off of Kinesis and DynamoDB streams. Right, right. But if I have Kinesis messages that I want to cache information about, the trouble that I tend to have is. Um, 
it's not it, a given shard is not necessarily re-invoked into the same uh, execution environment. Right. But the state is per Correct. shard. Correct. And so if I have cache information about um, records in the Kinesis stream and I put them in the state, I'll get them back on the right. other end. I but I only get a means. megabyte of state yeah, yeah. to, to yeah. do that. I mean, I guess in that point, you just eject to Dynamo or something, right? But but I don't want to have to. You don't want to have to. Like, it makes sense. Yeah. I don't want to have to go to Dynamo. Fair enough. Yeah. <clears throat> oh, yeah. Thanks, Aiden, for, for putting a link to that in the chat. Um, there's another announcement today, uh, also for Kinesis and Dynamo DB, DB streams, which is that when you have an error, um, instead of having to retry the entire batch or use the batch bisecting, you're able to return a value that says um, which record you last successfully processed um, or which record you first erred on. I'm not sure which one of those it is. Um, and it will then retry from that record and move the, the, the successful records um, out, which is pretty useful. Um, I think the problem, though, is that you then can't raise an error in that Lambda function. So you have to have some separate way of metricing that that's happening. And this, I think, shows the, the need that we have to have some additional channel besides success and failure to return information to the Lambda service. I think that's where, I mean, to some extent, that's where bisecting is useful, right? Because if you're if you have business logic problems, you can bisect down to the erroring function and then kick it out of the queue or kick it off the stream and go back. But uh, sure, and bisecting is useful because you you don't have to do anything for it to work, right? right? You just right. turn the button on, and yeah. AWS will identify your poison pill for you. Right. Um, and I guess if you're processing very large batches out of Kinesis. Um, and you have these maybe sporadic failures, right? Mm -hmm. Then I think you get a lot of benefit out of it. Um, yeah. I mean, it's like block, it's basically blocking versus non blocking erring, right? Like um, if I have strict ordering guarantees and I need to block on the error for some reason, that's where I'd use the checkpoint. Yes. Versus bisecting, where if I have strict ordering guarantees, but you have you ordering don't. guarantees in both cases, right? It's Kinesis either way. Uh, not necessarily, right? There, there might be if you if you have strict ordering guarantees on like a a ledger, right? There's certain times where you're just using Kinesis because it's an efficient way to get that in, and you don't have legal reasons that you can say just kick out this one transaction, and we'll fix it later. Versus there might be some situations where you say. If the thing is blocking on this shard, like we have to stop no matter what, oh, so we'll checkpoint to it. Yep. You're and saying then you have to fix bisecting, it. you would just eat that message to continue. Mm -hmm. Yep. And so once I don't you necessarily... bisected, yep, yeah, right. Yeah. It, it, bisecting is is useful in the case that your business logic is broken, your function errors, right, and you just bisect down to the point that it it doesn't yeah. err anymore, and you find the one that's the problem, kick the poison pill out, and continue. Bisecting super useful, but yeah. in the other case where you have decent error handling and all of that, you say, nope, this is a bad message. We're going to block right up to this point. So needed Sounds, and it's, yeah. it's quite clever, but. Ben Britz is saying uh, API for well-architected tool makes his life easier. Um, how does it make your life easier? So um, one of my complaints with the well architected tool is that it gives you a report, but they give you a lot of best practices, best practices, but they're not all actionable, right? So they say you should do X, I, and Z, or do X, I, or Z is a good thing, but they then don't give you an, an easy way to see, oh, this service would like solve that for me or help me solve that, things like that. So one thing that we do if we do well reviews with customers is that we actually do spend like 
we spend like the half day with them to go through their architecture and like do the, do the whole questionnaire. And, and usually that even goes a little bit more than half a day. And just like talk about AWS basically, like these are services that exist. This is like what you're already doing. This is what you could be doing. Uh, these are cases where you should focus. These are cases that you can like leave for now because you're not there yet. Um, and then at the end, we get like the report of it, out of it. And then I still spend like a few hours just making a list of action items. Like for example, like we talked about security and we talked about shift left, for example. So, hey, look at ECR, look at the image scanner there. That, that will help you there. There And so having a way to do the do report, so still do like the, that, um, that talk. And then being able to get like, oh, you didn't check those best practices. Here's a list of things you can put into that report uh, for your client, for our clients. And I mean, just remove the ones that are not applicable um, would be like a huge uh, time saver for us because we can slowly um, build up like that list of related services to each uh, action item every time we do a report. Uh, so we will like grow that and then just like deleting stuff um, that you don't need is a lot faster than having to write everything out every time uh, that you do make a report. So you would like automate the creation of sort of the value add reports that you put on top of the well architected tool. Is that what you're saying? Yes, that's definitely like how it would my make my life easier. Uh, I also like send the link to all the um, the software partners, the technology partners that we work with, uh, like we work with some that do um, scan your account and then give you like a compliance or, or conformity reports. And they always tie some, of, well, they tie some of those things to like pillars into the well architecture framework. So I'll also ask them like, yeah, if you can just like give me that report instead of a PDF, just import it into the well architecture tool. That would be like, be a very nice workflow to be able to go get a new AWS account, scan it. And I think you can do similar things with Audit Manager and, and Security App and things like that. Like they're, they're also more and more tying things into a uh, well framework, right? Uh, scan that and then get a notes field or a pre-filled. I, I don't think like any scanner will be able to say like you're now well architected or you're not, not well architected, but they could speed up that conversation, right? They could already show you, hey, you're not running any EC2 in that account. So like these and these and these things are not um, relevant here. Or they could like, uh, they're probably like, like the ECR uh, thing is, is a very good example. Uh, maybe they can detect that you used the IM access analyzer and then they can check the uh, continuous reduce permissions uh, best practice there. So there's definitely like a way to speed up certain things there. We've been waiting for an API for a well architected review to be to be expanded for a while. Um, is it, it the announcement? Then the, the updates that we've got. It's read only, right? Or we're not actually able to write yet, are we? That's it's question. read write as far as I can can see now. That yeah, okay. If it's write, then that's significant. Because mm. yeah, that that tool is um, it's fine but it's painful, right? And if you're trying to be efficient about getting data in there, then it's it's painful to the point where you don't really want to use it. But yeah, and both in and out, right? So the, the both directions are mm. usable, like you get a PDF report and things like that, but like it's a, like a lot of, either you do have to do a lot, do a lot of clicking through, through the um, web interface, or you get like a very big PDF report with like each, almost each question on each, on, on its own page. So the um, yeah, being able to pull that into like something that works for you, uh, or push something in there from a tool that you're already using is definitely very useful. Absolutely, and and partners who have got specific expertise in certain areas can reformat this report by exporting the data out and add value on top of it. Because otherwise, uh, you know, someone's just going to go and use the tool anyway. So um, yeah, uh, if it's if it's got right capabilities, then that's massive um, for that vertical sector of our lives. Nice. Um, another, so another use case for, not necessarily a use case, but um, as a use case for the well-architected API, I don't know, I was probably the only one who watched it, yeah. Um, so the serverless days virtual, um, Nicole from Lego, who was in Werner's keynote, Nicole and Hannah uh, gave a talk on how they essentially audit their environments for kind of correctness, how they service environments. And they use the well-architected tool to do kind of manual reviews of all their different services against the well-architected tool. 
this is something that they could definitely now build into their CRCD pipeline as opposed to something that they do as a manual review. Um, yeah, anyway, it's an interesting talk. If you go to the Service Days YouTube, it's the last talk from the Service Days October. Nice. Do you want to put a link to that in the chat? Oh, yeah, yeah. So Let me find it. Hang on. Make, make it easier for everyone. Uh, Thanks, Sam. Find it. Uh, someone mentioned the cost anomaly. Um, Aaron mentioned SageMaker profiling debugging capability. So, uh, can you tell us about that? I haven't I haven't read up on it. What what does it provide? So, so there, I mean, really simple things like just providing um, like CPU system load and some kind of um, like process management. Uh, so, obviously, more towards like GPUs and styled workloads. Um, but it's like a built-in functionality. I'm going to go try and find the link in um, that I had been looking through. But it's a, a built-in UI into SageMaker now, um, and basically just gives you like out-of-the-box profiling and debugging capabilities. Um, and so I think that's something that they're just you know layering in at the SageMaker level on top of the compute that they provision there. But um, not having to do that yourself on all the other raw compute platforms would be nice rather than installing the various tools, especially since it's presumably pulling, I'm trying to think, I forget if they get as granular as like per core metrics or whether it's still just like the, the aggregate CPU level. Uh, which, but, which would be more valuable to you just in terms of where you're getting the value? The library, like the, 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 the thing on the box that does the monitoring or the UI that lets you see it across all these boxes? Right, if you had to pick, you shouldn't have to pick, you should get both. But right. if you had to pick, which of those is the, uh, is the more valuable piece? I'd probably say the having the tools available to you on the host already rather than having mm -hmm. to kind of maintain them. Because um, if there was an API, if there was an agent that was in Amazon Linux 2 um, and it wrote to Cloudflare Metrics or whatever, and you could just pick that up. Um, that would be the the bulk of the value to you. I, I think so, the, yeah. Or the, because right now, basically, we just take a script, technology. throw it on the box, and then submit custom metrics to CloudWatch. Um, it, it's hard to pick because the other part is like then afterwards, you know, predefining your templates or having something that dynamically generates your CloudWatch graphs and um, kind of meshes those together and stacks them nicely, so you can be like, oh, okay, during this thirty minute period of my workflow, like. I was, it was all CPU IO weight. So I just oversubscribed this host, yeah. um, th those sort of things. So it's it's kind of hard to pick both, but I guess if, if it was just a flag or something that you could set to say like, launch this host with this already configured, um, then that'd be nice, just time saving. Makes ton of sense. So this this, no, this is interesting, right? Yeah. So um, what we're talking we're saying SageMaker. We are we are referring to SageMaker Studio. SageMaker Studio, this big push towards <clears throat> you have this um, machine learning uh, operations expertise level, and I want to be able to go in and I want to be able to train my models. I don't want to just pick off an uh, AI service off the shelf. I actually want to do my own thing. Um, and AWS's push since previous reInvent, I suppose, has been to push everything in this space into SageMaker Studio. And this reInvent, we've seen that continue. Um, and we are seeing we are seeing things surfaced in this tool, which could be done elsewhere and could be done by adding in some, you know, some some DevOps knowledge, do I say it, or just you know, general AWS infrastructure knowledge. We've got ML pipelines is in there as well. ML pipelines under the hood, there is, as far as I can see, some API changes and library changes in the SageMaker SDK to allow you to chain together steps. But what it does is hook into a whole bunch of existing AWS tooling. And so it's setting up code pipelines and it's setting up build stages and this type of stuff and setting up gateway gate points and stuff in there. Um, it's, it's SageMaker has always been, I suppose, and SageMaker Studio is this doubled. It's just 
if you are a machine learning operations person, this is where you can be. You don't have to know anything about AWS. You can just live in this world. And you know, from an SSO point of view, you can actually put SageMaker Studio as an application in SSO, and you can get your um, ML ops to just go and bypass the console completely. They are, it's like, it's genuine, like it's an application they're using, so they don't need to know about the rest of AWS. So this type of thing that we're talking about here and, and um, surfacing up these metrics absolutely could be done elsewhere. Um, but yeah, it's, it's trying to do it in a way that a non, um, a non infrastructure focused person can get access to it, which has been the SageMaker thing all along, right? In SageMaker, there's a bunch of APIs where you can put push the endpoint and you spin up a whole bunch of containers. You can do that yourself, but now you're doing it with a machine learning ML ops API endpoint. And they're just sort of keeping you in that ecosystem. And I'm not entirely sure how I feel about it, but it seems, I don't know, it seems to work. And then I gather with a lot of machine learning engineers um, and machine learning operations, the people who are this is targeted at. And I say, so who's using SageMaker Studio? And there's crickets. So it's it's a great demo. And I'm just, I'm wondering what the adoption of this kind of stuff is going to be. It'll be interesting to watch. Is anybody using SageMaker? <laughs> SageMaker Studio, Studio or otherwise? Fantastic Just question. out of this audience? Goran, you want? Just the... Uh... Just starting in a company to analyze some images for clients, trying to persuade them that that's, that's a good way to go. But the results are not that great as, I don't know, there's so, so, so much promise in these things, but uh, my clients are trying to detect uh, uh, what's inside the shelf from in the store. And it's it's still a hard problem. It's, we, we cannot, actually solve the problem. We're just try, trying to find some anomalies. But the reality, if, if you notice, there was a hype like two years ago in Walmart, they, they introduced some robot to go around the, the shop and uh, detect uh, what's on the shelf. Well, they discontinued that like a month ago because the, they found out that people are using that, 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 that the employees are doing that much better. Checking oh, yeah. the, so, and and also the everyone was annoyed by a robot going walking around and so I'm saying that uh, it's uh, all these things about the ML are, are, are useful for some some things you know but for some things they're not there yet and, and I think so this we'll is see. this is part of the problem too is like machine learning then incorporating artificial intelligence and also including machine learning research it's an enormous subject right. Like it is, it is the size of computing itself. Like, and, and there are people who can sort of get completely and utterly lost in PhD mathematics on a chalkboard, getting lost in, you know, beautiful minds type stuff. And then you've got people at, you know, at, at another end of a spectrum, which is, I'm not trying to imply any kind of value where we have developers um, plugging into AI API calls to make things happen in their applications. It is, it is an enormous subject space. Um, and you know we we talk about you know SageMaker Studio are we using it yeah not really and then and then and now right I un totally understand we're now having a conversation potentially about the efficacy of like some of the algorithms and the way they work. Um, then you got SageMaker Studio development this year and like they they're throwing in the zoo I think they called it a zoo they, they a quick start I think it's called. Um, that's it. That's a GitHub library. That should be a GitHub library, right? That's really all it is. And that's fine. And they should exist. And in the back of um, uh, SageMaker note, uh, notebooks, they've had all these examples for a long time. And that's, that's great. They should have that so that you could go to you know, a launch point that you can go into it. But it's not, it's not a feature. It's not actually a new feature. Um, and we need to stop sort of like making parts of machine learning sound utterly magical. It's awesome. And I find it amazing, but it's not, magic. it's not magic. magic. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't there Amazon yeah. recognition a ma a magic? I mean, they promised me a lot. I mean, and, and, and actually it solves a lot of problems that we spend so much energy trying to build models by, by ourselves. But then when we tried recognition, it just worked. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty the same. I mean, we got the same results and uh, it, it, it's great. But still, it's not there. Yeah, I mean, it, it's it's clearly a typical Amazon long term bet, right? They can't not they can't afford to not do this. Sure. So. Just to interrupt for a second, 
um, Mike and Jared, we never talked about how long we're going with this. I don't, I don't, I don't, have, um, I don't have a stop. I know it's early for, for Mike and it's a little later for Jared. Um, do you have a sense? Like I'm, I'm, you know, I'm continuing to be free. I didn't block anything out after this. So <laughs> No, it's a good point. I'm, I'm, I'm good to keep going. I don't know that Zoom kicks us out. So um, I think we're good to keep going. But you're probably right. We should probably set some kind of time. Otherwise, we'll still be here next week. Um, enjoy. Can we another hour? Yeah, let's do another hour. I'm right. Fourth that. week of reinvent. An another, <laughs> another, week another hour, or if everybody leaves, we'll take the hint. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, I, I yeah. So my my I'll 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 finish my point off there. I think that it's an enormous subject. It's really difficult, I suppose, when when these different service types and these different features are not are launched in this um, what's becoming quite uh, quite an enormous um, environment. SageMaker Studio. It's got these things which are targeted at people who are basically just starting. So quick start. If that's what it's called, jump start. That's it's really targeted at people who want to sort of have a quick go. It's really telling. Like you look at some of the demos that they do and they walk you through. Um, and I think it's even documented in some of these, like this is how you spin it up. This is how you throw data into it. This is how you make your endpoint go live. And then this is how you clean up and then get rid of everything. It's like, well, wait a minute. Like, am I putting something into production or not? Clearly I'm not with that. Like it's really their, their demos, their tutorials, and that's fine. It gets people into that, into that space. Um, but it's, it's hard to, see i don't see people using SageMaker studios in um you know uh, machine learning um consultancies to do real heavy work um i think people are using SageMaker generally but still to be seen it's i don't know there's there's, there's lots going on in this space and um I, yeah like like ben said i don't think we had anybody put their hand up to say that they're currently actively goran you said you were doing um Sage make a studio a bit. But. I have a, I have another question. Like you know how Amplify hides everything behind. You have like a you you make a service, but then you don't you don't see where where is my pipeline, where is my cloud front, where's so how do you feel about these things? What like uh, they make some kind of a studio for SageMaker, but you don't see these things. I assume yeah. you don't see these pipelines stuff like what are you so it's there. It's the same thing. It's it's is it CloudFront or not behind Amplify? It seems it, it's not like it's not the same CloudFront that we have. I, I have a feeling on this, and I'm, I'm just going to jump in now, and then I'll sit back for a bit because I'm sure Ben, Jared, you might have something to say on this as well. Um, and I'm um, hopefully this isn't derailing this, but um, yes, you have these services. Amplify is the one that really just exemplifies my my feelings around this, where you click on some buttons. And it spins up stuff, which I believe is CloudFormation, which will then go and set up a Lambda function to do something that it requires to do in the back end. So basically, it's like it's, it's a sort of user level service creation. And I'm, I'm kind of OK with that, apart from you are responsible for the code that runs in that Lambda function. You didn't actually deploy it. And in many cases, many developers will never know that that was actually deployed in their system because they're not paying attention. They're just kind of crack on with their, um, their React site. That's why they're focused. That's what they want to do. But you and your organization as a whole with the shared responsibility model, you're responsible for that actual function, for the, for the policies that get created, all of this stuff. You still got to be across everything. And this has been something which I've been watching for a while. It starts with the console that says, I'm going to deploy a, a policy for you to allow you to do this. That's still your responsibility. What's actually in there is still your responsibility. All right, I'll back out now. But um, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I strongly agree with, with Mike on this, that, yeah. that client side solutions, of which Amplify is, even though that there's a service around it, um, where it creates resources, the ownership of those resources, both from an architecture perspective and especially from an operations perspective is still on the customer, right? And so this is where a client side tooling is not a replacement for a managed service. Um, and so I think Amplify in general does a good job of the notion, it has a notion of graduating to sort of where you reach the boundary of what Amplify should be doing for you and start to take it over yourself. And so I think they're, the way they think about it is good. Now, of course, 
the amount of stuff that they create and uh, that you are responsible for is, is quite large. Um, whereas I think, you know, uh, if we look at other things like um, the CDK, for example, I think they do a similar sort of thing, which is how can we, you know, they create custom resource lambdas for the things that they need to do, and they don't tell you about it. Um, and their approach has generally been without that notion of graduation, right? That the stuff that the CDK hides from you is not stuff that they intend to reveal to you at a later date. And I think that's a worse approach than what Amplify has with a notion of graduation, right? Um, the CDK tends to talk about escape patches. And uh, yeah, I think of escape does. patches as, you know, if you're in a submarine and there's an escape patch, you go from being nice and dry um, and warm to being hundreds of feet under the sea. And it is not a pleasant experience. Whereas graduating is, is, is something that's uh, usually, usually looked back upon fondly. Um, and so uh, I think we want tools that educate as they, um, as they take care of something for you, right? You know, that when you're helping someone learn, the first thing you do is you're doing the thing and they're just watching you, right? And then eventually they're, they're assisting and then eventually they're doing it themselves. And you really need tooling that works the same way. Um, Ben says, Amplify, remove the custom resource lambda. It, sure, I mean, in those things, and the, I think the ACM certificate thing that like CDK did through a custom resource lambda. But the, the point is that, you know, they're both willing to put stuff in your account that you're responsible for without really telling you that that stuff is in your account. Um, and uh, I think that's always something to be very skeptical of. Um, but I, mean, I, I think the, there are ways that these tools, because you can't just throw somebody in and say, you have to understand you know, all the things that Amplify does right before you can create your first application. Yeah. I think it's useful, but it should either be that it's trying to transition that knowledge into the user, or it needs to be a fully managed service where the user is really only bringing the things that they understand and the operations of it is on the platform. So I think that's a long-winded way of, of saying that I agree with Mike. Um, <laughs> I mean, I, 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 yeah, disagree I, with that. Feeling. I think ultimately, like it, it, AWS is is scary, right? And Amplify, at its core, it, it is the spiritual competitor to a lot of like the Firebase stuff and those able things and amazon had to do something to to bring those kind of core people along right and say okay come on into aws you know we'll we'll get you going and the the custom resources and all of those things are the the solution to this thing is hard we can't do it in cloud formation but we're not going to make you do it and i can respect that um, but i do agree that you know there are sharp edges that anyone eventually runs into and it's not a pleasant experience. And I think, you know, decisions get made for the starters, like people that are just getting started, those decisions are made for them and they don't understand the long-term impacts at scale. Um, and it's tricky. I don't, I don't know what the answer is, right? I've had tons of conversations with uh, Richard and, and, and the Amplify team on certain things. Like even something as simple as, hey, this, this particular list operation is doing a DynamoDB scan. The people don't know that. And there's, has you know, some of those problems. And yeah, and at scale, I mean, that gets tough. How do you solve that problem, right? And I think they're doing a fantastic job um, where they can, um, but there's when you're trying to wrangle so many different services under your own service, there's decisions that those downstream services have made or can make that impact and end up bubbling all the way through your service. And I don't know if there's a great answer to that, but it's, it's non-trivial for sure. Uh, I quickly want to jump in because I see a very much a <laughs> parallel uh, with um, especially the, the early days of Elastic Beanstalk where that Elastic Beanstalk is a lot more 
uh, upfront about you still owning that that those things because it's basically like starting EC2s in your account that you can still see running. Um, and and you it also worked better if you know if you already knew uh, auto scaling a lot of things like that. So it's that's very much a tool that is very useful for people who had already that uh, EC2 and invest experience. Whereas I think Amplify is like. And you make a point like the ownership is the same concept there, well, I guess, as with Elastic Beanstalk. And, and I think that's absolutely true. But I think they invested a lot more into um, making it work for people who don't know anything about the uh, APS, but something that Elastic yeah. Beanstalk basically failed, uh, especially in its first uh, first few years. Um, and I think there, there's definitely like, uh, I, will, I hope there's like a push there to actually make it a little less magical or to, to show more what they're doing, because that was mo mostly my experience with trying Amplify. Like it works. And if you follow like a workshop, like everything works magically. And then you need to spend some time to figure out what are they actually creating for me? What is actually happening behind the scenes? Like if you know that it's doing something with Cognito, you know that it's doing something with, with um, uh, AppSync because you can get in GraphQL, but like, you still have to dive deeper into the, the things they're setting up and the cloud they're creating and like the code that they're putting on your local machine uh, to figure out how that all ties together if you actually have that AWS experience. So I think the answer there is basically just like making that bridge. And I know that's something that Ant also talked about uh, this week is to make it easier to ramp up that knowledge. Like you can start without knowing anything out of, uh, from AWS and then you uh, have a way to on board that basically like, okay, now it's running. Um, what is actually running? How do you use that? How would I manage it myself? What are the other options that I can put in there outside of Amplify? Uh, I think that is probably the way to go to have both the uh, very small um, cost of getting started while not neglecting the cost of actually keeping it running. Yeah, I think the, and, and you kind of can said, you know, some things are easier, things like that. And I think anyone that's building these services, Amazon or anywhere else, and when I'm building tooling for developers, I always think, you know, you can't just make the easy simple and then the hard impossible, right? Yeah. And if, if you do that, you, you're going to have so many bad days because you're just going to alienate expert users and you're alienating the people that are graduating through your service, right? So you have to you have to build with the idea that the hard needs to remain still complicated probably. Um, but I have that path forwards to do the hard things. You just didn't make it impossible for me. Well, and at the point at which you hit the boundaries of what's made easy for you, you've been taught enough yeah. to do the next thing you need to do. I think this, this is a marketing then, problem, yeah, right? Yeah. Sorry, uh, there's a marketing problem. Um, the 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 my my impression of the way that a lot of these services is marketed is just press this button, we'll get you on board, we'll we'll get you doing the thing. And if you are a developer who wants to put together a React site and you don't have, uh, you don't, you know, you're working on your own from a little room somewhere. Um, the idea that um, I know how to do my Node.js development, um, so I'm going to set up this little app, I can ignore everything else, is potentially, it's potentially the way it's being marketed. And it's, it's difficult because you don't want to put these people off, but at the same time, you need to say, here's the on-ramp. You've still got to climb the hill, but we'll help you climb the hill. I think it's more than marketing. It's, it's about tooling design. Right. Right. The marketing has to frame it correctly, but I think tools can be designed to make, to hide more or less of what they're doing and to teach you more or less, right? To have some progressive revealing of complexity or to have escape hatches, right? But sure. what if, if, you, if, you, if one day you want to say, okay, I don't want to be in this boundary of Amplify. Can you just give me cloud formations, cloud formation templates for, for what I have now and just open my cloud formation so I can get in and change what I like. Just give me what, what you just created. And uh, my, my biggest concern is that, that they're not using the same services. Like I, I realized that for CloudFormation uh, in, with Amplify, there is no Wildmark domain uh, support. And uh, with, uh, with the Amplify, you have, you have maximum of 50 domains that you can make. <laughs> so, how can that be? Isn't that the same cloud formation? 
the cloud uh, cloud front sorry so i was just worried that that's another service <laughs> it maybe yeah. is another version version two that everyone now every service now has a version two so yeah for, for sure i think um the thing to know about amplify uh, console specifically is they actually manage the cloud front behind the scenes for you and they do a couple of things like they maintain an entire warm pool of like cloud fronts that they can just like stick your stuff on um um to speed things up so behind the scenes there's actually some magic going on there um, and there is ways to eject into cloud formation yeah. Um, and you can actually put custom cloud formation in Amplify, but all of that yeah. said, it's not obvious. Can you um, export everything? Oh, <laughs> uh, you can. Yeah, you will, ish everything. for the most part. But then Literally. you end up with this weird scenario of, great, this tool generated stuff for me, and now I have to figure out how the generated stuff works. It's not like you get Sam or something clean necessarily back out of it. How do they um, decide what should be um, hidden from you? Like say the cloud front and code build. And what should be put in your account, like Cognito or other things? It feels Couldn't do. No clue. rather arbitrary. And it's like, yeah, yeah, you could either make it all manage services or stick it all in the devs account. But yeah. this mismatch, I feel, makes it harder. Um, could Amplify the... be a CloudFormation module, perhaps? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I uh, think they're getting, oh, sorry, go ahead. Wait, no, go no. ahead. I was just going to say, I think they're getting some things right. Like they definitely like expose you to, there are different components here. Like you have an out component, you have an API component and things like that. So they're, they're, they have a way to make the dev aware that they're adding in extra complexity and extra responsibility to there. I think it's just, um, there need to be a way to make that easier to figure out, okay, what is now exactly being added here? So if the moment that you say, I want to do my own out or I need like custom out in there, I want to do password to, password plus signing, for example, that you already own that stuff and already know what you're using there. And when you're not like that invested, in, like when, you, when you're the one person developer who's just wanting to write React, that you basically can see, okay, it's going to have like some logical defaults. Here are some pitfalls. You still have the ownership there, but I think they do for most of those a pretty good job of be um, having it something then that is just like the managed service without any, a lot of things around it so that the management component of that is as as low as like being the inside of Amplify itself. So I think uh, Hansel mentioned that he has a question if we want yep. to move on from Amplify. <laughs> <laughs> We've been talking about it for a while. Sure. Um, firstly, thank you for this opportunity. This is really cool and very exciting. Um, but my question was, so we have a use case where uh, from our identity provider, we want to send changes to user profiles to multiple different systems, um, and our identity provider being Azure AD. So we thought of using the graph function or the graph API that they have specifically Delta changes. And so we built um, our serverless solution using the publisher subscriber model. So Azure AD on a specific cadence publishes changes for users to an SMS topic. And then the, on, on the other end, we have consumers that subscribe their queues to this topic. Mm. Now, the issue that we're facing and, and we're foreseeing rather is not all consumers care about all the attributes for a specific user that are changing. Um, and on the Azure AD side, it returns up to 12 or 15 attributes and, and two of them are always consistent. So they are a uh, unique uh, global identifier. And so we looked into SNS filter policies and that fixes the use case for some um, consumers where they care about, let's just say the male attribute display name and uh, job title. So if any of those three attributes exist, sure, SNS filter policies work but it, we cannot figure out how to um, architect the solution where um, all three attributes exist and then the consumer picks it up. So I was wondering if any of you had thoughts on that. So if you put, for example, right, so SNS has sort of some relatively simple filtering right. on message attributes. Now, if you delivered those into EventBridge, I was going to say Tim's on the call. Yeah. You can, uh... <laughs> um, uh, 
would that help your situation where, where you'd be able to provide um, those messages on an event bus that then EventBridge rules could access not just sort of those single attributes, but whatever the content of the message was as well? Possibly. I, I haven't looked too deep into EventBridge, um, but I think that kind of does make sense. Yeah, EventBridge has pretty powerful like content filtering capabilities. Um, you can have different kinds of rules and stuff like that. It and sounds think, like what you need. Yep. I think some things that you would want to think about is whether you're using the default event bus in that account, because um, you can create custom event buses. Um, you can also distribute events to other accounts. For example, if, if uh, people need to receive those accounts in a certain uh, account that is local to whatever they're doing, you can you can sort of distribute it out that way. Uh, but it seems like a decent solution. You still need a lambda in between. You need a right. lambda that listens to the S or receives the messages from the SNS topic um, and transforms them into whatever message you want to put into EventBridge, which you would then be able to determine. Um, but you can't go direct from SNS into EventBridge today. I see. Okay. And so would I post the body or would I specifically dissect it and say, here are the attributes from this message to event? Well, what is the body? Um, say the, the body consists just the demographic information of the user. Um, so, and at all times it's returning the employee ID and the GUID for sure. Is it, um, and then the attributes are saying what has changed? Yeah, so it says, okay, here's the new job title. Um, it doesn't explicitly say it's changed, but we know that the Delta, um, I guess the Delta functionality of Azure AD only returns changes. Yeah. So would you want then, I mean, is, is the body like JSON or is it? It's JSON, okay. all JSON. Yeah. Um, so, and the attributes in the message are also repeated in the body. Yes. So you could just put the body as the message that you're sending into um, into EventBridge. Okay. Although, you know, sort of the, the thing that you know that your downstream consumers may not, right? Which is that Azure AD is firing off these particular things. That sounds like it's sort of under your ownership. Um, right. So you could add, you know, a username changed or whatever it is field into that body JSON as well that then people could listen for so they understand um, so they can rely on what you know about the changes rather than that knowledge of, oh, Azure AZ Delta's only happened on these particular things, so I can trust that it's changed. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. You, you've given me some ideas. I'll definitely have to look into that. Thank you. So That's awesome. Lo logically speaking, you know, the, the notion that attributes are magically different from payload is, is kind of bullshit. I mean, they're all really part of the message, um, but de facto on SNS, uh, they're handled quite differently because if you encrypt the content, you end up not encrypting the attributes. And so that's why, you know, one of the reasons why, you know, they filter on, on attributes, but not content. The notion that uh, SNS should be able to do what EventBridge does is, yeah, a good sounding idea if you could figure out how to do that. Yeah. Um, but you know, don't get hung up on whether it's an attribute or content. You can just you know, stuff the attributes inside the content that you want or pull fields out. Um, and yeah, EventBridge will give you all the filtering you need. Awesome, thank you. The other, the other thing that EventBridge does uh, in this particular area that SNS you might struggle with is um, who, who's responsible for the actual subscription Right. Um, if you break it out to event bridge and then you say uh, some team says, you know, we care about these particular change events, uh, user email change events or something like that. You can say, great, I'm just going to publish. I'm just going to create an event bridge rule and then publish those to your event bridge in your account um, cross AWS account. And then it's on them to subscribe Lambda functions or anything else that cares about it on their end. You don't have to care about the actual subscription stuff like an SNS. Um, you know, have to go through the whole 
subscribe, confirm, all of that nonsense. Right. I mean, and that's and that's the model we were thinking of is we just publish and consumers say, oh, okay, this publisher has the information I want. I'm going to subscribe to it. Yeah, I, I mean, if you can avoid having multiple event buses, that's nice. I mean, the reason, the most common reason for multiple event buses, buses is that people can write security rules against them. But, you know, if your security situation allows, just dump everything on the default bus, why not? I mean, or, or, or have a single application bus and dump everything on it and let people post rules against it. Um, it, 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 you know, it, it also there's like extra charges for moving things from one event bus to another. Um, so I don't know, I, I would try and do it in the simplest possible way with one bus or the minimum number anyhow. Um, the thing that I'm waiting for most to, to help teams decouple is to be able to create a rule in one account that subscribes to a bus that is in yep. another account that is shared via resource access manager, right? Today you can sort of access the bus in the other account, but the the resources that are associated with the bus and the subscriptions have to be in the same account. Um, until then, uh, you know, what I've, what I've done tends to be, yeah, if, if, if I can get them in the same account, sure. Um, but often I'll have, you know, one application um, that's developed in one account and then another application in the other account and they just agree on what the schema of the event is. And then as a platform team create the cross um, the cross account uh, delivery, so that they don't have to care that they're on different buses. Now, I wouldn't do that for something high volume, but Azure AD changes are relatively, you know, they're not um, hundreds per second usually, um, kind of a thing. Um, uh, and so I think it, yeah, it depends on how how. Where, where those teams are today, right? Kind of a thing. I mean, yeah. luckily it's, it's a small team so we can keep everything in, okay. in one account. Um, but that, that's good cool. to know. Cool. Ben, what you mentioned about being able to reference cross account um, resources, uh, it sounded almost like what you want was released about a month ago, uh, but I'm probably misunderstanding what it is that you desire i don't think when you create a rule and you specify an event bus so the the event bridge policies resource policies i think can grant publish access but i don't think you can create a rule in account a with an event bus arn in account b on it you can now as oh, of a month ago yeah so i have that now i didn't realize that that came with that update yeah so that um, blog post, see, I knew that that feature was coming. And even then, when I read the blog post, I didn't understand that what was being described. So because I've uh, just yeah. been having conversations about moving to a central bus, and I've been like, we can't do it yet. Yeah, so you can have, uh, an, like you said, uh, an event bus in account A, and account B can create rules uh, on that bus in event in account A. Oh. In which case, never create more than one bus unless uh, you've got, uh, so I think the thing that Tim said is now uh, really possible, even, even if your organization is, is not arranged around making that easy. There, there are reasonably sane access controls in to, to cover that? Uh, so I would have preferred better. Like for example, when you specify um, the resource, I wanted to be able to enforce a rule, uh, you know, when account B creates a rule on on a bus in account A, it had to have a certain prefix, you know, say cross account or something, just for sanity. That's not possible. Uh, you in can't. The research policy. Yeah, you can't limit say name prefixes on the rules. You um, can do that on the account B side, right? I think you can do that as part of an IAM policy on create rule. Yeah, maybe you can, I haven't checked. Um, you can do things like uh, any rules on that bus created by a third party account. Um, oh, let me rephrase it. Account A has the bus, account B and account C can both put rules on that bus. 
you can make it so account B can't delete rules created by account C. Then I work that way by default. Technically, you could make it so account B has the ability to put rules on the bus, but can so also wait, delete wait, rules created this, by anyone. This doesn't sound. This doesn't sound like the same thing. The policy is on the create rule action, correct? The pop. The, so if the, I do list rules in account B locally, I would not get the rules that are subscribed to the other bus, right? You'd have to specify the event bus. Um, but what it sounds like, if you're saying that I can control whether um, uh, account B can delete account C's rules, that the actual rules themselves are being placed in account A. They are. Right. And that's what I'm saying is the difference. I want to say that the rule itself exists locally in account B. Why do you want that? For exactly this reason that I don't have to, I don't have to even think about whether account B can touch account C's rules. So well, you're, you're still going to have to have some sort of rule in place in A saying that B is allowed to do that. So, so it's not obvious that you lose any complexity. Like, do you want bus A to appear in account B and when it shows a list of rules, it only shows a subset? Because I can I imagine that would be confusing. All the rules um all the rules that it has and say you know some of those rules the event bus is not local to the account i think what ben is describing is very similar and i think hence the resource access manager i think to vpc sharing where you can put your own ec2 instances into a shared vpc but you cannot see what the other accounts are putting in there even though technically if you you have that network connection right so if you know the ip address you can uh go to them so you have a shared data plane but the control plane is completely separate uh, tied to the account mm -hmm. yeah i could see some value in that and now i guess um so then the other question is does this work with um with cloud formation because yeah. usually cloud formation doesn't work um when you've got a resource policy that allows you to do something in, in another account Right. Yeah, if it didn't work with cloud formation, it would be dead to me. You know that. Okay. What's confusing in both the API and in cloud formation is it says, you know, when you create a rule, it's got a property called event bus name. Yeah, but, but it's you an can, arm. but you have to specify no. an arm. <laughs> you have to, or oh, sorry, you can specify a name if it's within the same account. Okay. But uh, cross account obviously has to be an arm. Uh, yeah. This is most of the way through. Well, Aiden, since you're talking about that already, did you do you know if they fixed the issue with cloud formation in EventBridge where you uh, got all the numbers translated to strings instead of keeping them as numbers if you put something there? Uh, I'm not sure what you mean. You mean like in say an event pattern? Yes, if you made an event pattern and you had a number in there in your pattern, then uh, cloud formation would transform that into a string. Um, um, which would mean that depending on the pattern that you have, uh, it would not match. It's still I haven't had to match on any numbers, so I hadn't dealt with that. It looks like it's still happening. I, I'll put the link to the CloudFormation roadmap issue in the chat. Uh, Scott, that link you shared is, yeah, what we're talking about. That's the one. So Ben, I'll suggest rereading it now, knowing what you know, and see if it's any more decipherable because for me. Yeah, I'm definitely like... going to dive into this because it does sound like, like I said, 90% of the way to the thing that I that I think is my end goal. I guess uh, it was briefly mentioned before. I think, uh, Tim, you said just use the default bus. Um, something that I've been struggling with for the last you know, several months is I feel like I haven't developed an intuition yet for when I should be creating new buses versus sticking things on the default bus or do people have a feel for that yet? Because I don't. I think Tim said always use the default bus unless you've got. Yeah, my opinion that. was that the only good reason to have uh, um, event buses at all, you know, aside from the secret, the default invisible one that's built in there, 
um, is to write security policies against. Yeah. And how do you think about that then in terms of the AWS events that go on that bus? So in other words, if I, if I want to partition my user events from AWS events, does that mean that I should just sort of have a auxiliary default bus that is all my custom events? Well, the vast majority of rules have the detail type field match, yep. right? And, or, the, or the source or de this part of the source type. And um, you know, uh, you're probably looking for your own source, um, yep. which is going to effectively segregate it from any of the AWS sources. So I, I've never seen that be a problem. Mm -hmm. Nice, nice. Well, look, we've got we've got about twenty minutes left um, on our self um, self inflicted <laughs> restriction on time. And um, you confused me a lot. I just got to say that. <laughs> my virtual background. Oh yeah. <laughs> I'm glad it's a virtual background and not you're not actually sat on my lap. Um, no, I'm going to no, have to be no, honest. Bit <laughs> <laughs> um, of fun with this. So how, um, how are just um, before people probably start dropping off as we get towards the end? Um, how are people enjoying this? Um, is this something that has been useful? Is this something you would come to periodically if we had it? Um, what kind of cadence would you want? Um, and then, is this the right medium for it? Any thoughts on that? Well, I think I speak on behalf of everybody when I say, Ben, I'd just like you to be permanently on camera so we can drop in and chat to you whenever we feel like it. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but if that's not possible, Ben's question still stands. I think this is also awesome. yeah. you. Your, your knowledge and wisdom is, is greatly appreciated. I think this is awesome, and uh, it's it's awesome. It's exciting to me because um, some of you on this call I follow on Twitter, and so I know I'm in the company of giants here. Um, and just just learning from you is is great. So I'd love to join more of these. Well, I think uh, part of the reason to do this in this format is uh, that we learn from each other, right? When you're asking questions, um, I'm learning from the answers that. Uh, that other folks, especially you know Tim, is is is, is answering for EventBridge, um, and then everyone else who's also here attending gets to learn from all of the questions and answers, right? Um, uh, and so I'm I'm excited about this kind of format. I think, um, but yeah, again, uh, you know, if we did this monthly, uh, if we had one of these next week as sort of another post reinvent one kind of a thing, I mean that's week of Christmas, not a lot of people are going to be um, necessarily paying attention, but um, uh, what would people, you know, how often do you have questions that you'd want answered? Or how often would you? Uh... I feel you like uh, during regular time, monthly is probably a good cadence. If it was every week, people probably wouldn't do it. And then, you know, it might be too often. Um, yeah, it's a, a significant amount of work. Um, yeah, that'd be good. Uh, and then, you know, maybe doing a couple in, in January around that, um, around that week, but something like monthly. Um, Tim says he liked the, the gorilla scheduling where uh, we announced it, I think Monday and then Tuesday, I forgot to say anything about it. And then today we were like, hey, this is happening. Come, come join us. Does that work for people or would you much rather have a scheduled thing that you would count on? Someone said that there should be a camera in the iRobot office when, when things like uh, with kinesis <laughs> happen. And so we can just watch and, and you do everything. And, and, well, it's uh, not me. It's, I, I, I have a team who's, who's really good yeah, yeah. Uh, but, um, at doing I realized all this. They were just staying there and waiting if I understood your tweets. And not doing anything while everything is burning. So, how did you manage? Yeah, I mean, it was certainly, um, I mean, certainly uncomfortable, right? You don't want, you know, uh, in any in any outage, right? Your customers are not getting uh, the value out of the things you're providing, um, and that's never fun. 
Um, but uh, when you know a that uh, these things happen very rarely um, because they're very good people uh, running the running the services, um, and uh, that you know that those very smart and talented people are working as hard as they can to fix it, you know it's going to be fixed as quickly as it can be fixed. Um, and so as an operations team, you know, certainly the, you don't get to estimate a time to, to resolution because you don't have any visibility into the, into the work that's feverishly going on on the other side of that API. Um, and so you, you have one less tool in your toolbox, which is you don't get to say, well, we think this is gonna be done by this time until you get that message in personal health dashboard that says so. Um, uh, but it's certainly, you know, your confidence that it's going to come back, um, and that it's being addressed is, you know, very high. And I think that reduces a lot of stress during those incidents. Aiden, you're oh, talking yeah. about getting a transcript for these videos. That's an interesting idea. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if that's something that's can be built into zoom. It I feel like it should be. Um, maybe that's something we can look at. It'll, I will put it up on YouTube, which I know will at some point do. Um, it might not translate a bark, but transcribe a bark. Um, at some point, it will get subtitles or something. But um, yeah, if it becomes a regular thing, I think we need to just constantly be aware of tooling and what we're using and, um, and whether there are benefits and uh, efficiencies we can make. Yeah, I'd just love to be able to hit Command F and refer back to. Yeah, that's a really good point. Look, what, I, what I'll do in, um, in terms of the YouTube upload, certainly for me, I mean, I'll, I'll make this video available so that other people can upload it too. But for, for me, when I upload it, I'll try to put some timestamps in there in relation to um, some, of the, some of the big ticket items that we've talked about. But um, we'll see. I've made the commitment now. I, I was thinking about doing it. Now I'm going to do it. So. <laughs> so are you excited about this chaos thing and in relation to what happened? Can can we can we simulate things that, that oh, happened? Like, yeah. So I'm I'm interested. I haven't had a chance to dive into it yet. Are you able to cause faults yeah. between AWS services integrated with each other? So it's not to kinesis. Not to kinesis. It's not on the list. It's, well, sure, it's sure. But for example, can I make, you know, when Lambda is listening to a DynamoDB stream, can I inject latency in that? No, uh, my sense no. was that it's more about controlling uh, chaos between sort of serverful architectures. It's pretty strictly, it, it's effectively like Chaos Monkey um, in its early iterations where it can go turn off EC2 instances, RDS instances, so um, things like that. You have to give it, from my understanding, like effectively the turn off um, IAM permissions. Like you just hand it a roll and say, you know, go turn stuff okay. off. Here's my plan. Here's my strategy. By the way, if these cloud watch alarms go off, stop doing whatever you're doing. Um, it's, it's mostly it, testing your chaos, right? It's not testing behind the scenes AWS chaos. That's pretty much my understanding as it sits right now. Yeah. Like I can't, it's, it's not what, it's not what you want, Ben. I know exactly. Like you want the thing where it's like, can I test that 50% of my, you know, transactions to Dynamo DB have three seconds of latency, or um, I'm trying to see if my S3 bucket has extreme latency at five plus seconds. Does my CloudFront origin actually cut over correctly? Yes. And that's the second thing, because the first thing I can test, right? I can inject that latency yep. in my Lambda when it's reading from DynamoDB. Sure. Now, of course, I couldn't do that if I have API Gateway directing into DynamoDB. So that's what, right. where, another place where I need it. And of course, you know, for me, I think I would want that to be an account, an immutable account feature. So at account creation time, I either say that that ability is on or off. So that my prod account, I can say, you know, I'm not doing it in, in here and I can be sure that no one else can. Because that yeah, would be think, a great way to go mess with somebody. I think it was like Colin Percival or something on, on at Twitter said, I want an AWS region that everything's just always breaking all the time, like at a service work. level, right? That would also work. US East One doesn't break all the time. No, not enough. <laughs> <laughs> I need like AWS dumpster fire. Yeah. And just everything breaks all the time. 
You know, there, there's a lot of these breaks where just uh, some small clients around the world uh, see every day. Like I, I had like two times for six hours outage of Aurora cluster and that six hours. What region, what region was that in? In Ireland. So it's, it's mostly um, Aurora bug related to MySQL, some distributed transactions in MySQL. It's, it's not easy thing to, to, to handle. And uh, it took them six hours and they had to do something, you know, and, you know, people don't really understand that there's many things like that that happen all around the world. Yeah. So six hours in Aurora, it's like everything is broken in your, in your system. So and this is where, um, uh, I mean, to be, to be fair, that that's your database was broken, not the service being broken. Right. I mean, there's a distinction there. The, just it just crashed and uh, it crashed because of the bug which is in aurora which doesn't really it didn't really uh, properly handle uh, distributed long running distributed transactions which is resolved in mysql some some version but it's not it was not resolved in the aurora but anyway like it, it took them 6 hours to to re to fix the problem and uh, restart the servers you know so Things like that happen all around the world all the time. So it's uh, it's it, it would be great to simulate things like that. Just okay, I don't have my database, but it's like Ben says. Maybe every service should have its own parameters to to tune it properly. So like SQS event bridge to tune the the chaos that you can put in. So one day maybe we will have something like Ben said, so that we can trick everything. And... Well, we now have a service name that it will go under, which is a step in the right direction. <laughs> yeah, expect we're in 2021. Lots of AWS Fizz Aurora cluster. Who is going to be? I've got a question. Um, mm -hmm. Are we hitting the the edges of the account model? Um, because you know you've had the conversation now about event bridge and there's VPCs and all that. Um, one of the services announced that reInvent was Proton, um, which there's lots of opinions about. But one of Proton's biggest weaknesses, so Proton is intended to be a centralized deployment tool where a central team can control environments and deployments. Um, but it, it, a, it's not multi-account. <laughs> so if you have a centralized team controlling deployments but it can only control deployments in the account that it's running. Um, that's one of the problems, but it's designed, the way it should be designed is a service that sits across multiple services. Yeah. Um, and, you know, there should potentially be an interface for the central team and a separate interface for the uh, developers who are deploying uh, services to bind, service templates to bind in Proton. And that's just probably an example of where the account model is starting to hit you know, a, a rough edge, you know, and should there be organization wide services and maybe an organization level account where you deploy a service there and it can then have, have child services that are potentially controlled by a parent service or something like that. I think they're going down this road a little bit with SageMaker yeah. Studio and EMR Studio, not at the admin level, but at the user level so that when you're using SageMaker Studio or you're using EMR Studio, you're logging into the studio. You're not logging into a particular account. Yeah. Um, on the other hand, for the admin side, they're doing it at the organization level, right? They're saying, all right, great. You can you know, have an organizational level view of the whole thing. But I think what you're talking about is when I have a dev test prod set of accounts for a given service, yeah. I need something that crosses those set of things. I think resource access manager is part of the answer there. Um, but I'm not sure, like it, it's definitely a need because um, you don't want to get, you don't want to give the person who owns, you know, service A permissions to your whole organization just yeah. so that they can control those three accounts. But I also don't, you know, we don't have a good model for saying these three accounts are part of a shared set of resources. 
an OU in organizations is a security boundary, which is a little bit Terrible. of what we're talking about. But we're also talking sort of about resource boundaries here. Um, and so resource access manager, the idea behind it is that when you share resources between accounts, then the account, then the access for that resource looks local in the account that you shared it to. Uh, which, so instead of it looking like cross account access, it looks like local access. And I think that could help solve some things, although I'm not sure that's generally, I think, sort of a backwards model for um, what you're saying with Proton, where instead of it being, oh, I want all of my ECS clusters to be shared with the account that Proton is in, you sort of want to share Proton across yeah. the accounts um, in a way that it gets access out rather than the access being local. Yeah, I'm not sure. It's, I it's think you've got to be careful. Good. Sorry, I think you've got to be careful because like, we, we spent, we, you know, we've, we've gone from having one account, we've got multiple accounts, put them in an organization. And we did that because we want those very distinct security boundaries, right? Like, like yep. very easy to see. Um, then if you start to, if you start to go too much back the other way on top of this, then you end up with, well, now we need to have an account with, we need to have a structure with multiple organizations because now we've got our production organization. So you, you, it's, yeah. I don't know where you go. I mean, I mean, that's just an artifact of accounts were the best tool we had for blast radius, right? Yeah. Like yeah. It's, and we still do. I mean, it still is yeah. the best. Right? Yeah, it's still, yes. It's security boundary and operational boundary my account limits, right? I can put a service in, in an account and know that it's not gonna affect other services. I can give someone access inside an account and know that it's much harder for them to access data that is not in that account than that isn't an account. But generally with the sort of CICD things, we tend to be talking about the things that have broad permissions anyway, right? It's the thing that can go and set up all your stuff. So it needs permissions to delete all of your KMS keys and things like that. Um, I think it's, I yeah, that's, like, if you could, if you could give Proton an OU in the organizations that would sort of get you towards that, <laughs> but you only have five layers of, o, of OUs and you don't really want to burn one on your, you know, sort of, well, and that's also going to mess with the, well, current recommended way to split oh, your OUs because you want right. to have it different brought to your stage as like you're on your root level and then having to put organization uh, teams into that, that's not going to work. So just to explain that a little more, um, because OUs are best used today as a security boundary, you don't actually want it to mirror your org structure, your sort of, you know, architecture structure. Uh, um, what you want is to mirror the security boundaries that you need. So you want your production OU to have all of your production accounts for all of your services. And then your dev OU to have all your dev accounts for all those things. So you don't have an organization's construct that understands that the prod account for service A and the dev account for service A are linked in any way. Uh, so that wouldn't be a good way to um, to grant Proton access to a collection of accounts that are related. Yeah, I'm just thinking to how we, we did this. We we had like we have like the dev OU, staging OU, prod OU, but then we have this other capability where each service team gets their own delegated build CI/CD account, and then we've wired it up so their their build account can only touch you know their accounts. And you get this weird thing where the way that a service team sees things and the way that our security systems see things is completely different, but it's, it is hard to set things up that way. Right. Like if you're not, if you don't have effectively a dedicated team to build and manage that out with a really strong process, that's, it's extremely complicated to understand. And to be fair, the idea of multiple routes or multiple organizations inside one uh, billing context is, is something that we actually want. So they're definitely like, I don't think um, like saying you should never have more than one organization is, is something yeah. that, that that's true. You could definitely move to, I have my production organization and then that is 
uh, and, and mirror things inside that or have like an organization per team and then have a central way to put your um, SAPs and things like that into every organization. There are definitely ways that that could be built. I'm not sure if like which one is a good idea and which not, but there's definitely I mean, a need for. <laughs> the, thing, the, thing, the thing that makes the thing that's a good idea, I don't think any of us have have hit upon yet. Um, right, I think Ant brings up a very good point that this is a gap that isn't served by any of the the existing concepts that we can apply to the problem, and so we need something new or something to to at least bring in some feature that looks at this problem in a different way to give us the capability that we need. And I think that's something that I tend to try and identify when, when I ask things of AWS is when, am I, when should I be asking for something inside an existing service versus asking for, for something new? And that's where, you know, for example, I don't think Lambda timeout should be extended much beyond 15 minutes that if you have a 60 minute timeout, we should have something that does that, but it shouldn't be Lambda functions as they exist today, kind of a thing. And so similarly, um, this thing could be something, you know, that organizations has some other concept that you can link your dev test prod accounts um, across OUs to indicate that they are related and that Proton could leverage that concept or resource access manager should sh support a way. It is a good question though about whether if you had that thing that linked those three accounts together, where would you put the Proton application? Uh, probably at the top level. Oh, hmm. like, would you put it in a prod account? And I, I feel like this is the central crux of Proton is, are they going to provide us guidance on how this should be done? Or are they gonna provide Proton as this kind of framework and leave it up to the community to figure out these practices? And I really hope that they provide guidance on, on how to do this. But I think it's, it's a question that's beyond Proton, right? It's, it's for any of these things that any of the code star suite um, that works this way, you know, pipelines, the answer for code pipeline has generally been from AWS. Oh, you put a pipeline in each account alongside the, um, the application it's supposed to deploy. But now I don't have a unified view of what's happening across those pipelines. I don't have a good way of making changes to those pipelines in a unified way. Um, but I'm still unclear of, if I had that thing, what account would I be logging into to see it? Now, what Jared had said about, maybe it's a separate account for build infrastructure, makes some sense in for that, right? That there's a, you have a different boundary that indicates. You're effectively asking for like a service construct, right? Yeah. Like I have my OU, which models my security constructs yeah. and, and organization. How do I have like a service construct, which is the view that a team might have into this? And can I give the service team a service, like a management account of some kind? Hi there, uh, you pretend to step in. I'm, I'm just lurking and I have uh, a millionth of operational uh, experience compared to what any one of you on the call have. I'm just listening, Please trying to in. learn a little bit. But the thing is uh, what you, you're describing Jared as a service, at least, so I'm an industry analyst, just basically looking at this at 50,000 foot view. Uh, isn't that precisely the, the notion of an application within an enterprise? Like the application is precisely I, what is supposed to cover, like uh, it, uh, you talk about a, a credit billing application, you talk about the uh, uh, online banking and, and that covers all stages. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure if it would be service or an application on its own right. And, and I think someone mentioned about having a separate production account for Proton, just like they're doing a separate account for, or a separate destination for the, the for uh, Security Hub or something. So you yeah. have, anyway, sorry, just just uh, just chiming in. Yeah, no, to, uh, I, and, and I think uh, so, so some of this is just 
the the terms that we're overloading onto the vocabulary. But uh, so when I say service, um, I definitely mean like a, a a team's view into where their application is running through dev, staging, and prod. And what I would hope then is something like Proton. Um, depending on how you want to look at that, this is where it gets complicated. Is Proton going to be built for that service or application team and they have a person that maintains how that rolls through their stages or, or how they attach to it? Or is Proton another level up and service teams get to leverage that? I don't know. And maybe it's both. Maybe. How, do you compa- how would you compare Proton to Security Hub? Uh, from what perspective? From like the perspective of how you're, how you're going to do management for that. Like for, uh, sorry, I, have, mm. I, I could be completely off base. I apologize. Well, I think, I think the difference tends to be that most of these organizational pieces exist across the, organ, the entire organization, right? They're organizational. Yeah. In the security hub, it's rare that you have a situation where one team of 10 people needs a security hub view of six accounts. Right. Okay. It's the case that you want to roll that all the way up to the top of the organization and see across everything. Um, so I think the the whereas what we're talking about with Proton is a team has three accounts yep. that comprise this application. How does Proton exist across those three accounts? And maybe the answer is that you know the way that Jared has it today, you have dev, test, prod, and build as your set of accounts that you create when you're creating a service. Mm-hmm. And Proton and related CodeStar suite services make it easy to have one account that gets access to these things only at a control plane level, for example, right? Um, rather than at the data plane level, um, that the sharing in there is, is well scoped um, uh, so that you're not, um, uh, is well scoped so that you're not handing, right? Usually with those build pipelines, you want to have permissions on behalf of the pipeline that the people who trigger the pipeline do not have themselves, right? Sure. Would also be easier if all of that's happening in a separate account. Yep. I, I think Fernando had done uh, a really good point there uh, that this is not just a deployment problem, right? It's also a billing problem. It, it's in every domain that you want to look at. You have that very separate view of, I am someone who looks at the whole organization and I have like different levels of things that are allowed. And I'm someone who looks like as a product owner or an application manager or department level, these are the things that I care about. And either I don't want to see the rest or I'm not allowed to see anything else. And that's a very different uh, view that you need there. That's a good point. I don't want to see anything else. I don't. I couldn't be able to see anything else. Yeah, I think um, Azure has an interesting way of dealing with this, that, which could be viable potentially. Um, mm-hmm. Where so Azure has uh, the billing is a billing subscription, but you can have a hierarchy of subscriptions. So you have your parent subscription, which typically is your enterprise agreement. Um, and there will be a, literally a, an Azure subscription account created on that. And then that can create child, child accounts, child subscriptions, and then that can create more child subscriptions. So you could potentially have a situation where you have your, your billing subscription, which you really don't deploy anything into. Um, that's literally billing. And then you create a subscription below that, which you can then relate to cost center, you know, script, a, a subscription per division, and then a subscription per team. The individual team could potentially then create um, uh, AWS does have another boundary called resource groups. Uh, no, Azure has another boundary called resource groups. So you could either use subscriptions in to isolate your environments or you can use resource groups. The security boundary is more on the, you can create a security ground boundary around resource groups. I wouldn't advise, advise it, but you might want to do something around like, uh, yeah, so you could have a team have their parent account, which has all your shared tooling, uh, and then have child or it would Azure would be child subscriptions, but in AWS potentially child accounts where you can have a hierarchy of accounts with parent child accounts where um, uh, service permissions can flow down um, and you can control billing on all of those as well. Each one has a billing context. 
which can generate its own separate bill, um, which rolls up all the way. Um, maybe that is a way. I think one of the problems AWS obviously has, this whole organization thing was something that was done after the fact. It wasn't built into the design. So it's all been, you know, you know, people need this thing. How do we get it? And it's, well, it's only four years old, organization. Oh, yeah. yeah, so. It's, uh, yeah, it's yeah. certainly, you know, we're taking baby steps. We're getting baby steps in the right direction, right? Um, PhD announced that it integrates with organizations, but you can't delegate it yet. So all the things we're getting, we're getting incremental progress, which I'm glad for, um, but yeah. Um, so I think we're, we're pretty close to time. Yeah, I think so. We're just over the two hour mark. I think that's, um, I think that's a pretty good length. Although I really appreciate um, everybody turning up to this and thanks to everybody for their feedback for, for the session oh. as well. Um, yeah, look, I'll, I'll upload this video as soon as I can. I like how Ant's now disappeared. So it's just me sitting in another cell. Yeah. Thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, much, much appreciation to look everybody who's been on this call. I'm not going to pick out everybody by names. Um, and a few people have left now that we need to appreciate, uh, thank them as well for, for everything that's happened. But um, I, I'll, I'll send a link around to everybody and then tweet. Twitter will be the place where you can find um, a link to this video when it's uploaded. Um, share it around with people. I'm beginning to think that this session should be like the community PRFAQ session where some, we, we need someone who's actually a scribe who can be um, writing down all these things and we'll send them in. <laughs> Good feature requests come out of, come out of discussions. Like that. 100%. I'm going to say it. This for, for me, this has been the best session of reinvent so far. But um, that's that's my own my own view. So um, thank you to everybody who's been here, and um, yeah, maybe we'll wrap it up there. Any final words from anybody? No, I just really appreciate people turning up with with questions that they they want to talk about. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Thanks very much. Thank you, everyone. See you next time. <laughs>